Hello everyone and welcome to the coronavirus edition of the third lecture from our signal theory class. In this lecture we will talk about a continuous time Fourier transform, discrete time Fourier transform and a discrete Fourier transform. First, the continuous time Fourier transform or CTFT. This is one of the four types of the Fourier transforms which is used for the continuous time aperiodic signals. In this lecture, I will show you how to construct that continuous time Fourier transform based on the type of Fourier transform which we had in the previous lecture, that is the Fourier series. Just a reminder, this formula was used to transform the signal in the time domain into its complex spectrum, and this formula was used to transform the complex spectrum back into the time domain. We also called these C sub k the coefficients of the Fourier series and this was the Fourier series itself. This omega sub k was a sequence of discrete frequencies which were given as 2 pi times the fundamental frequency times k where k was integer. Today I will also denote this fundamental frequency times this k as f sub k. Alternatively, you can write omega sub k as 2 pi divided by the fundamental period times this integer k. In the last lecture, I told you that the Fourier series works for continuous time periodic signals, mathematically written like this. Now, what about those aperiodic signals? That I will try to explain in this picture. So here I have this pulse which is aperiodic and I would like to do its spectral analysis. That means that I would like to find out what are the spectral components of this signal, what are their amplitudes and what are their phases. But thus far at my disposal I have only the Fourier series which can be used for periodic signals and I cannot use it for aperiodic signals. With aperiodic signals there is simply no period I could use here. So what am I going to do? Well, I'm going to cheat. At first I will not analyze this entire signal, but I will pick just a part of the signal. At first I will take only the interval from minus 1 to 1. That means that I will take only this part of my signal, which is plotted here with the thick line. Next I will take this part of my signal and I will repeat it periodically. By cheating like this I will turn this aperiodic signal into a periodic one. And a periodic signal I know how to analyze using the Fourier series. So now I can take this formula, apply it to this periodic signal and obtain this spectrum. For the sake of simplicity I'm plotting just the amplitude spectrum but the complex spectrum can be computed as well. Now let's take a closer look at this spectrum. First, from this aperiodic signal I picked the interval from minus 1 to 1. This interval from minus 1 to 1. That means that this periodic signal will have the period of 2. The fundamental period of this periodic signal will be 2 seconds. Consequently, the fundamental frequency of this periodic signal will be 0.5 Hz. The second harmonic would be at 2 times 0.5 Hz, the third harmonic would be at 3 times 0.5 Hz and so on and so forth. To better illustrate the connection between this index k and the respective frequency in Hz, I have plotted both the axis for the index k and the axis for the frequency in Hz. And here you can see again that when k, that is this k, this k, this k is 1, the respective frequency in Hertz is 0.5 Hertz. That means that when I'm talking about the fundamental, the first harmonic, my respective fundamental frequency is 0.5 Hertz. And the second harmonic would correspond to 1 Hertz, the third harmonic would correspond to 1.5 Hertz, and the fourth harmonic would correspond to 2 Hertz, and so on and so forth. And from here you can also see that the frequency step between two subsequent harmonics is 0.5 Hz wide. Here I've wrote it down mathematically. When I take the frequency in Hz for some k and I subtract it from the frequency in Hz for some k plus 1, I will get a difference delta f which in this case will always be 0.5 Hz.
So when I cheat like this, I will get this spectrum where the individual lines are 0.5 Hz apart. And this spectrum could tell us something about the frequency content of this pulse because a part of this pulse is actually included in this signal, which is the one being analyzed. But is this the best cheating I can do? No, I can do better. When from this signal I use only the interval from minus 1 to 1, I will leave out some parts of my pulse out and those will not be analyzed. So if I want to improve my cheating, at minimum I should use a longer interval. And that is what I have done in this green case. Here I used the original signal from the time minus 2.5 to the time 2.5. And here I use this longer part of the original signal as a period which was then repeated. Now when I compute the spectrum of this periodic signal using the Fourier series, I will get this. This spectrum will now give me better information about this original signal because a longer part of the original signal is now included in this periodic signal. One additional thing which is important to note here is the change in the spacing of these spectral lines. Now the length of the original signal that we use, that is also the period of this periodic signal, is 5 seconds. That is the fundamental period of this periodic signal is 5 seconds. That also means that the fundamental frequency of our periodic signal is 1 over 5, which is 0.2 Hz. Consequently, the second harmonic will be at 2 times 0.2 Hz, the third harmonic will be at 3 times 0.2 Hz, and so on and so forth. Check it out at this axis for k and this axis for the frequency in Hz. So this is where k is equal to 1, that is the first harmonic, and that corresponds to 0.2 Hz. This is the second harmonic where k is equal to 2, and that should correspond to 0.4 Hz. This is the third harmonic, which should correspond to 0.6 Hz, and for example this one, that is the fifth harmonic, and that corresponds to 1 Hz. So now the spacing between two subsequent lines in Hz is 0.2 Hz. So when I improve my cheating and I use a longer part of the original signal, my spectrum gets denser. That means when I recompute the indices k to the respective frequencies in Hertz, the frequencies that correspond to these individual lines are closer together at least in comparison with this red case. Now what if I cheated even better? What if I included even longer part of this original signal? What if I included the interval from minus 5 seconds to 5 seconds? Well, if I cheated like this, I would get this periodic signal and this spectrum. And you can see that this spectrum is fairly similar to this one, but in this case, those individual spectral lines are even denser. Where does that increased density come from? Well, this interval, which is also the period of this periodic signal, has the length of 10 seconds. Consequently, the fundamental frequency of this periodic signal will be 0.1 Hz. The second harmonic will be at 0.2 Hz. The third harmonic will be at 0.3 Hz. The fourth harmonic will be at 0.4 Hz, and so on and so forth. So, here, this is the first harmonic when k is equal to 1, and when I recompute that to the frequency in Hz, that will correspond to 0.1 Hz. This is the second harmonic, where k is equal to 2, and the respective frequency in Hz will be 0.2 Hz. This is the tenth harmonic, and the respective frequency is 1 Hz. So in this case, two adjacent spectral lines have frequencies in Hz which are 0.1 Hz apart. So overall you can see that when I improve my cheating and I use a longer part of the original signal, this newly created periodic signal will have longer fundamental period and lower fundamental frequency. The frequency of the first harmonic in Hertz will be lower, and because all those higher harmonics have frequencies that are integer multiples of the frequency of the fundamental harmonic, this spectrum will get denser as the period of this periodic signal increases. Now, if I took my cheating to the absolute limit and I would use infinitely long interval from this original signal, 
That would mean that the period of this newly created periodic signal would also go to infinity. Consequently, the difference between the frequencies of two adjacent spectral lines would go to zero. The frequencies of these spectral lines would get infinitely close together, they would become a continuum and this discrete spectrum would turn into a continuous one. But when I took an infinite interval of this signal, I essentially took this signal in its entirety. So this is in fact the spectrum of this aperiodic signal. The moral of this story is a trick that allows us to compute the spectrum of an aperiodic signal with the Fourier series. First, I need to take only a finite part of my aperiodic signal, turn it into a periodic signal and compute its spectrum using the Fourier series. Then I will send the length of that taken part to infinity, which will do two things. First, it will give me the spectrum of my entire aperiodic signal and second, the spectrum will turn from discrete to continuous. In the next slide, I will show you how we can formalize this using a mathematical formula. So, from the previous slide, we will start with the formula for the coefficients of the Fourier series and we will send the period to infinity. What will happen? Well, first the integration limit will now go from minus infinity to plus infinity. Second, when I send the period to infinity, the frequencies of two adjacent spectral lines will get infinitely close to each other. Also, the angular frequencies of two adjacent spectral lines will get infinitely close to each other. That means that the frequencies of the individual spectral lines, that is, these frequencies, will no longer be discrete. They will no longer be only integer multiples of the fundamental, but they will turn into a continuum. Every real number can be a frequency of a component contained in our aperiodic signal. Consequently, these frequencies omega sub k will turn into this omega and this omega can be any real number. Last, we will deal with this term 1 over t. If this term was retained here, we would end up dividing this integral by a number that would go to infinity. That would probably diminish the value of this integral to zero, which would be depressive. To avoid that, we will just bluntly leave this term out of the game and we will not use it here anymore. But can I do such things? Can I just leave out something that I do not like? Well, this is not a formal mathematical limit. This is just a description of an idea and with my idea I can do whatever I please. By that right, I give you this formula, which we call the Continuous Time Fourier Transform or CTFT. Sometimes this is also referred to as the Fourier Transform. The Fourier Transform we can also write like this. This is the Fourier Transform of my time domain signal. And the result of the Fourier Transform is the spectrum, the complex spectrum of my signal. If my signal is denoted with a lowercase x, then typically its spectrum is denoted with an uppercase x. And this spectrum is now a complex function of a real argument, which is the angular frequency typically denoted as omega. Here I wrote it again. This is the definition of the continuous time Fourier transform. This we call the complex spectrum of our signal x of t. If we take the magnitude of our complex spectrum, we will get the amplitude or the magnitude spectrum. And if we take only the phase of our complex spectrum, we will get what we call the phase spectrum. Now, if I have the complex spectrum of my signal, which is the description of my signal in the spectral domain, and I want to turn this complex spectrum into the signal in the time domain, I need to use the inverse continuous time Fourier transform. The formula is this. I will not derive it, but I will at least explain the meaning using what we had for the Fourier series. So for the Fourier series, we took those complex exponentials at the frequencies of the individual frequency components and we multiplied these complex exponentials by their complex amplitude. And these complex amplitudes we also called the coefficients of the Fourier series or the complex spectrum of our signal.
Last, we summed everything together and that gave us our signal in the time domain. Here I have something very similar. Here are the complex exponentials. Their frequencies are now the continuum of real numbers. These complex exponentials are multiplied by these complex amplitudes, which is the complex spectrum of our signal. And last, we put everything together. Here we had a sequence, so we had to sum. But here we have a function of a real variable, so we have to integrate. This scaling constant 1 over 2 pi cannot be shown from this analogy, but if you worked out the math, you would see that you would need to divide this integral by 2 pi to get the signal in the time domain exactly. So this is how we convert our complex spectrum into the respective signal in the time domain. Now just some very basic properties of the continuous time Fourier transform. If this is the definition formula of the CTFT, then when we change the sign of the angular frequency, the only change in this definition integral will be that this minus will go away. Consequently, for the real signals, that is if this signal is real, this integral will have the same value as this integral, except it will be complex conjugate. Therefore, the spectrum for some negative frequency will be the same as the spectrum for the same positive frequency, except it will be complex conjugate. The spectrum for some negative frequency will be the same as the spectrum for the same positive frequency, except it will be complex conjugate. If we take the absolute value of this, we will take this. The amplitude spectrum for some negative frequency will be the same as the amplitude spectrum for the same positive frequency. And if we take the phase of this, we will get this. The phase for some negative frequency will be equal to the minus phase at the same positive frequency. So for the real signals, you will be getting the spectra like these ones. This is an amplitude spectrum and you can see that this spectrum for negative frequencies is the same as the spectrum for the positive frequencies. This is the phase spectrum and you can see that for negative frequencies it is the same as for positive frequencies except with the opposite sign. Do not forget that this holds only for the real signals. If this signal was complex, this symmetry will no longer hold. Now let me give you an example how the continuous time Fourier transform can be used for the spectrum analysis. Here I have an example signal in the time domain. It is a difference of two unit steps. This first unit step is time shifted to the left by the amount given by this capital T and this second unit step is time shifted to the right by the amount given by the same capital T. When you plot this function, you will get this pulse. Here it is plotted for t equal to 0 0.5. Now we would like to perform the spectral analysis of this pulse. We would like to find out which frequency components it contains, what are their amplitudes and what are their phases. To do that, we need to compute the continuous time Fourier transform of our signal. To evaluate this integral, I need to realize that my signal is zero everywhere except in the interval from minus t to t. So I do not need to integrate from minus infinity to plus infinity. It will suffice to integrate from minus t to t and the value of my signal that I will be integrating is 1. This 1. Now this integral is actually very easy to evaluate. It is this. And when I substitute these two limits, I will get this. Here I need to identify that these two exponentials can be written as a sign, so this expression can be written in this form. Here I have just multiplied and divided by the capital T. When I do that, here I have sign of some argument divided by the same argument. So I have this type of function, which we call the sync function, the sync function or the sampling function. So using this sync function, I can write this result in this form. And this expression is the complex spectrum of my signal. This expression tells me what are the complex amplitudes of the complex exponentials at the individual frequencies.
In the case of this specific signal, we are a bit lucky. Its complex spectrum has a zero imaginary part. These values are only real. So we can actually plot the complex spectrum like this. Typically, you cannot do this because the complex spectrum is, well, complex. But for this specific signal, we can plot the complex spectrum easily, which will help us to see what is the magnitude spectrum and what is the phase spectrum. So the magnitude spectrum is just the absolute value of the complex spectrum. The phase spectrum will be zero in this interval where the complex spectrum is real positive, and in this interval, it will be pi, or alternatively, it could be minus pi, which is the phase of a real negative number. And in this fashion, this phase will alternate between 0 and pi for positive and negative parts of this sinc function. So if you want to write the amplitude spectrum mathematically, you will take the complex spectrum, you will take the absolute value of that complex spectrum, and that will give you the amplitude spectrum. The phase spectrum is just the phase of this complex spectrum. It is kind of easy to analyze in this picture, but it is somewhat more difficult to write mathematically. First, forget about this gray part and this gray part. Now, let's first deal with this interval where the sinc function is positive. This first zero will happen when the argument of the sinc function is equal to pi, that is where this sign is equal to zero. So this zero will happen when this argument is equal to pi. That will happen when omega is equal to pi over capital T. When omega is equal to pi over capital T, when I multiply it by capital T, all that will be left here is pi, and that will be the point when the sinc function goes to zero. In this plot, you can see that it happens for omega equal to 2 pi, which happens when capital T is equal to 0 0.5. But in general, this interval happens between 0 and pi over capital T. Now, in the sinc function, the periods where the sinc function is positive will happen with the period of 2 pi, that is the period of this sign. In this sinc function, where the argument is multiplied by the capital T, the period will be 2 pi divided by T. So in this case, where the capital T is 0 0.5, that period will be 4 pi. But in general, for this sinc function, those periods will repeat with period 2 pi over t. So when I add integer multiples of 2 pi over t to this inequality, both on the right-hand side and on the left-hand side, this inequality will define all the intervals where the complex spectrum is positive. And that works when omega is positive. If I want to express the same thing for negative omegas, I will just include this absolute value here. With this absolute value, this inequality will do the same work for, for example, 3 pi and minus 3 pi. So this inequality is how I can define all the intervals where my complex spectrum is positive. I recognize that this can be a bit confusing, so what I would suggest is to take a pen and paper and work it out yourself step by step. Now that I have defined all the intervals where my complex spectrum is positive, I can say that in these intervals the phase of my complex spectrum is zero. And if my complex spectrum is not in the intervals where it is positive, it is in the intervals where it is real and negative, in which case its phase will be either plus or minus pi. It does not matter which sign you pick, both of these phases represent a real negative number. So overall, this is the phase spectrum of my signal, which is plotted here. One last thing, this axis and this axis and this axis, they are the same, and they represent the angular frequencies in the radians per second. If I divide these values by 2 pi, I will get the frequencies in hertz. So to plot these spectra, you can use the frequency axis in radians per second, or you can use the frequency axis which is given in hertz. In this slide, I will tell you about the discrete time Fourier transform.
But first, let me tell you why we need yet another type of the Fourier transform. Well, previously we had the Fourier series and the continuous time Fourier transform. Both of these transforms are usable for continuous time signals. That is, mathematical functions like sines, cosines, exponentials, and so on. But real-world signals that can be stored in a computer are going to be sequences of numbers, that is, discrete signals. And the Fourier series or the continuous time Fourier transform are not usable for discrete signals. They do have their uses, for example, they are good for theoretical calculations and even better for torturing students. But if you want to analyze a real-world signal stored in a computer, you need a free transform that can deal with a discrete signal. For that purpose, we will have the two remaining types of the Fourier transform, and the first one is the discrete time Fourier transform or DTFT. Before I will tell you the details about the Fourier transform for discrete signals, I will first need to talk a little bit about sampling. What is sampling? Well, you need sampling, for example, when you want to record some sound with your microphone and then you want to store that sound in your PC. The microphone is going to give you a continuous time signal, but your PC can store only a discrete time signal. Your PC can store only sequences of numbers. So you need to turn your continuous time signal into an equivalent discrete time signal and this conversion is called sampling. Typically the sampling is performed by a part called analog to digital converter and even more specifically by a circuit called sample and hold but that is out of the scope of our class. In our class we will only learn how to describe sampling mathematically. Actually, it is not that complicated. When you want to turn your continuous time signal x of t into a discrete time signal x of n, all you need to do is to periodically take the sample of your continuous time signal, turn it into a number, and that sequence of numbers will give you your discrete time signal. This is how you can write it down mathematically. First, you need to pick some sampling period. That is the period with which you are going to sample your continuous time signal. Now the integer multiples of the sampling period are going to give you the times at which you sample your continuous time signal. That is, this time, this time, this time, this time, this time, and so on and so forth. Now you will take your continuous time signal and evaluate it only at these times. That will give you these values. Those are the values indicated by these dots. And for the sake of simplicity, we will denote these values as x of n, which will be our discrete signal here indicated in green. A little bit of nomenclature. As I told you, capital T sub s is called the sampling period, and 1 over the sampling period is called the sampling frequency, and we typically denote it as f sub s. Now that we have formalized sampling, I can show you how you can take the continuous time Fourier transform and turn it into a Fourier transform that can be used for discrete time signals. We will start with the formula for the continuous time Fourier transform and then we will sample all these continuous time signals. That means that instead of that continuous time, we will use only integer multiples of the sampling period. Now, when you substitute this in this signal you will get this which is our discrete signal that is basically this process and when you substitute this into this exponential you will get this now this entire expression is now a discrete signal you have one sample for each n Consequently, I cannot integrate a discrete signal, so instead of this integration, I have to use this summation. And this resulting formula can already be used to compute a spectrum of a discrete signal. But before I call it the discrete time Fourier transform, I will do one more adjustment. I will take this omega and this sampling period and rewrite it. I will write this omega as 2 pi the frequency and I will write this sampling period as 1 over the sampling frequency. This expression we can also write like this and we call it the normalized frequency and denote it with a capital omega.
This capital omega is called the normalized frequency because when the frequency of this exponential goes from zero to the sampling frequency, this entire expression, this capital omega will always go from zero to two pi. So this capital omega expresses the frequency of this exponential relative to the sampling frequency. So it is normalized relative to the sampling frequency. Now, when instead of omega times the sampling frequency, I use the normalized frequency, I can rewrite this expression in this form. And this is the discrete time Fourier transform or DTFT. The result of the discrete time Fourier transform is the complex spectrum of our discrete signal. The capital X of the capital omega is the complex spectrum of our X of n. If we take the absolute value of our complex spectrum, we will get the amplitude or sometimes we call it the magnitude spectrum. And if we take the phase of our complex spectrum, we will get the phase spectrum. If you like the things to be done with mathematical formalism, you may be disappointed by this rather informal conversion of the CTFT to the DTFT. If this is the case, let me satisfy your inner mathematician with a bit more formal description of the sampling and the derivation of the DTFT. First, the sampling. Mathematically, we can describe the sampled signal by taking the continuous time signal and multiplying it with a train of Dirac delta pulses. This expression is best understood in a plot. This is my continuous time signal and this red signal is that train of Dirac delta pulses. These are Dirac delta pulses time shifted to the position which is the integer multiple of the sampling period. And the sum of these Dirac delta pulses, that is this sum, will create this red signal. In this red signal, I have Dirac delta pulses at the integer multiples of the sampling period. That corresponds to the time where I want to sample my signal. Now, when I multiply my continuous time signal with this train of Dirac delta pulses, that is when I multiply this blue signal by this red signal, I will get mostly zeros, except at the positions of the Dirac delta pulses. There I will still have the Dirac delta pulses, except now they will be multiplied by the respective value of the continuous time signal. So, for example, this Dirac delta pulse will be multiplied by this value. In this plot, I indicated multiplication by increasing the height of these arrows. For example, this Dirac delta pulse occurs at the time five times the sampling period, which means its height will be given by the continuous time signal at the time five times the sampling period, which we also denote as the discrete signal for n is equal to five. So hopefully from this plot, you can see that I can rewrite this expression into this one where the individual Dirac delta pulses are multiplied by the values of the continuous time signal at times to which these Dirac delta pulses are shifted to. And these are the values of our discrete signal. So, for example, the Dirac delta pulse for n is equal to 5 will be multiplied by our discrete signal for n is equal to 5. And this is how you can describe sampling mathematically. You retain the information about a continuous time signal only at the positions of these Dirac delta pulses, which occur at the integer multiples of the sampling period. Now, when you describe the sampled signal like this, you can take the formula for the continuous time Fourier transform and substitute this sampled signal, that is this expression, here. When you do that, you will get this expression. Here, you can change the order of the integration and summation, which will give you this. In this expression, note that this signal is not dependent on time, so for this integral it is a constant, therefore we can take it and pull it out of the integral. When we do that, we will get this. In this expression, we will evaluate this integral using the sampling property of this Dirac delta pulse. This Dirac delta pulse will sample this exponential at time equal to n times the sampling period. So the value of this entire integral will be this exponential at this time equal to n times the sampling period. It will be this.
consequently you can rewrite this entire expression like this and here when you denote omega times the sampling period as the normalized frequency capital omega you will get this expression which is the discrete time Fourier transform so this is how you can derive the discrete time Fourier transform with more mathematical formality before we move on and we start talking about the properties of the discrete time Fourier transform, let me illustrate the properties of the DTFT on a simple example. In this example, we want to use the DTFT to compute the spectrum of this signal. The signal is 1 when n goes from 0 to some capital N minus 1. The signal is 0 otherwise. Here, the signal is plotted for the capital N equal to 6, and you can see that the signal is this pulse. Here, I would remind that whether you work on paper or in MATLAB, you should always first draw your signal before you start analyzing it. If you don't, you will probably screw something up. Now that we know what our signal looks like, we can proceed with computing its spectrum. This is the definition formula of the DTFT. Before I start evaluating it, I will first take a look at my signal where I will realize that my signal is zero everywhere except in this interval, which is the interval from zero to the capital N minus one. Consequently, I don't have to sum from minus infinity to plus infinity. It will suffice to sum from zero to the capital N minus one. And in this interval, my signal will be equal to one. This is my signal. Here I should realize that this expression can be written in this form and then I should realize that this is actually just a sum of a finite geometric series. Using the formula for the sum of the finite geometric series, I can rewrite this sum into this form. And this expression actually is the complex spectrum of my signal. You could take it and plot it in MATLAB. But you could have a little bit of trouble if I ask you to write the expression for the magnitude spectrum of my signal. So let me explain how you can do that in these two steps. First, from this numerator, you will extract this exponential, which is actually this exponential, except this exponent is divided by 2. When you extract this exponential from this numerator, this is what you will be left with. Check it out. When you multiply this exponential with this exponential, you will be left with e to the zero, which is this one. And when you multiply this exponential with this exponential, you will get this. So this is the same as this, but the expression in this bracket, you can actually turn into a sign. And in the denominator, you can do essentially the same thing. You will extract this exponential, which is this exponential, except with this exponent divided by 2. And when you extract this exponential from this denominator, this is what you will be left with. Again, check it out. When I multiply this exponential with this exponential, I will get e to the 0, which is 1. This 1. And when I multiply this exponential with this exponential, I will get this exponential. So I can express this denominator like this, except here this bracket can be also written as a sign. Overall, I can write the division of these two brackets as the division of these two signs. And I can write the division of this exponential by this exponential as this single exponential, which can also be written like this. This entire expression is equivalent to this one, but in this form it is very easy to take the absolute value. The absolute value of this exponential is 1, so that will have no effect. So the absolute value of this entire expression will be given only by the absolute value of the division of these two signs. Consequently, the amplitude spectrum of my signal will be given like this. And this amplitude spectrum I have plotted here using MATLAB. There is a couple of things I would like to point out in this plot. First, this horizontal axis 
On this horizontal axis I have the values of the normalized frequency in radians and that is as it should be for the discrete time Fourier transform. But in addition to this normalized frequency itself, you should also know the relationship of this normalized frequency in radians to the frequency in hertz. The relationship is given by this formula, which is how we defined the normalized frequency in the previous slide. This is what I'm talking about. Now, using this formula, you can transform the frequency in hertz into the normalized frequency in radians. So for example, if the frequency in hertz is equal to the sampling frequency, the normalized frequency in radians will be 2 pi. If the frequency in hertz is equal to the sampling frequency, the normalized frequency in radians will be 2 pi. If the frequency in hertz is equal to half of the sampling frequency, the normalized frequency in radians will be pi. And of course, if the frequency in hertz is zero, the normalized frequency will also be zero. Now, if you rewrite this expression into this form, you can recompute the normalized frequency in radians to the frequency in hertz. So for example, if this normalized frequency is 2 pi, the frequency in hertz will be equal to the sampling frequency. If the normalized frequency is 2 pi, the frequency in hertz will be equal to the sampling frequency. And if the normalized frequency is pi, the frequency in hertz will be equal to the half of the sampling frequency. Do not forget about this relationship between the normalized frequency and the frequency in hertz. Normally, the spectra will be presented only with this axis where you have the values of the normalized frequency and you will be expected to be automatically convert these normalized frequencies into the frequencies in hertz. Now, the second thing I would like to point out in this spectrum is that this spectrum is actually periodic. You can see it kind of indicated in this plot, and if you want to see it more formally, you can examine this formula, which is constructed only from the functions which are periodic and they also have a common period. And this is not just some random occurrence for this signal, this is actually a freaking property of the spectra of discrete signals. Here I have it examined in general. Let's say I want to examine what the discrete time Fourier spectrum looks like when I add an integer multiple of 2 pi to my normalized frequency. This is actually quite easy to do. I take the definition formula for the discrete time Fourier transform and to the normalized frequency I will add that integer multiple of 2 pi. Next, I need to realize that I can break this exponential into the product of these two exponentials. And I also need to realize that the phase of this complex number is an integer multiple of 2 pi. So this complex number, this complex exponential is equal to 1. Consequently, this entire expression is equal to this and I can write this expression in this form. And this expression is nothing else but the definition of the discrete time Fourier transform for the normalized frequency omega. So from here I can see that when I shift the normalized frequency by an integer multiple of 2 pi, it will have no effect on the value of the complex spectrum. That means that the DTFT spectrum is periodic with the period of 2 pi. This is how you can write it mathematically. Also, for the real signals, we have the same properties that we have seen for the continuous time Fourier transform and for the Fourier series. The complex spectrum for some negative normalized frequency capital omega will be the same as the complex spectrum for the same positive normalized frequency capital omega, except it will be complex conjugate. Consequently, the amplitude spectrum for some negative normalized frequency will be the same as the amplitude spectrum for the same positive normalized frequency. And the phase spectrum for some negative normalized frequency will be the same as the negative phase spectrum for the same positive normalized frequency. On top of these symmetries, you can actually include this periodicity to obtain some additional symmetries. When I get this symmetry and write it in the opposite order, I will get this. Now, using the periodicity of my spectrum, I can add 2 pi to the argument of this expression. That will give me this. 
I will help you to visualize this in a second on an example of an amplitude spectrum. For that amplitude spectrum, I will get this relationship. This you can get either from here, which you will first write in the opposite order, and then using this periodicity, you will get 2 pi to this argument, which will give you this. Alternatively, you can just take the absolute value of this expression, which will also give you this. Now from here you can read that the amplitude spectrum at some normalized frequency omega will be the same as the amplitude spectrum at some frequency 2 pi minus that omega. So for example, the amplitude spectrum at some frequency pi over 2 will be the same as the amplitude spectrum at some frequency 2 pi minus pi over 2. This value will be the same as this value. Or more general, this part of the spectrum will be the mirror image of this part of the spectrum, with the axis of symmetry being this vertical line going through the normalized frequency of pi. Another way how to think about this symmetry is this. Because of this property, you will have the symmetry with respect to this vertical line going through the zero. And because of this periodicity, this part of the spectrum must repeat here. That also means that this part of the spectrum will repeat here. Consequently, you will have the symmetry with respect to this vertical line. So the DTFT spectrum has a lot of symmetries in it. And it's a good idea to keep all of these symmetries in mind. If you forget about them, you can actually interpret the spectrum incorrectly, which I will show you during the exercises. Now, for the sake of completeness, I will comment this line. That is actually the combination of this line, which I have written here in the opposite order, and this periodicity, which I used to add 2 pi to this argument, which gave me this. And from here, I can read that the phase at some normalized frequency omega will be the negative phase at the frequency 2 pi minus that normalized frequency omega. Here I do not have the phase spectrum, but if I had the phase for normalized frequency, for example, pi over 2 would be the same but negative as for the frequency 2 pi minus pi over 2. Overall, keep in mind that the discrete time Fourier transform is for signals that are discrete and aperiodic, and the spectrum of the discrete time Fourier transform is continuous and periodic. At this point, all of these symmetries may appear like a bunch of useless stuff. But in the exercise, I will try to illustrate how you need to be aware of these symmetries so that you can properly interpret a spectrum of a discrete signal. The last thing I want to show you in this slide is the inverse discrete time Fourier transform. Without much mathematical derivation, I will give you the formula, which is this. This formula is actually quite similar to the formula for the inverse continuous time Fourier transform that has this form. There are actually only two key differences. The first difference is in this exponential, which now has this form, which corresponds to the exponential that is used in the forward discrete time Fourier transform. The second difference is in the integration limits. With the inverse continuous time Fourier transform, we were integrating from minus infinity to plus infinity. With the inverse discrete time Fourier transform, we have a periodic spectrum. So all the information about a signal is hidden within one period. So it suffices to integrate only from 0 to 2 pi, which is one period of our spectrum. The integration does not have to go exactly from 0 to 2 pi. It can be any interval with the length of one period. The choice of integration limits is similar to the choice of integration limits that we had in the computation of the coefficients of the Fourier series. And overall, this formula tells the same story that we had with other inverse Fourier transforms. We take the complex exponentials which are contained in our signal, we multiply them by their complex amplitudes which are given by the spectrum of our signal, then we add everything together which will give us our signal in the time domain. If you actually made the effort to crunch all the mass, you would see that you also need to add this scaling for everything to work perfectly.
In this slide, I will introduce the fourth type of the Fourier transform, which is the discrete Fourier transform. First, why the heck do we need yet another type of the Fourier transform? Well, our motivation is that we want to process discrete time signals in a digital computer. But thus far, neither of the Fourier transforms that we had is suitable for this. We had the Fourier series and the continuous time Fourier transform, which are designed for the continuous signals, not the discrete signals that are typically processed by digital computers. A little bit of improvement can be provided by the discrete time Fourier transform that works for discrete signals, but the discrete time Fourier transform has a continuous spectrum, also not something easily represented in a digital computer. On top of that, the discrete time Fourier transform is defined for an infinitely long signal, which for a real world computer that cannot add infinitely many numbers is yet another hindrance. So to be able to analyze real-world signals in a real-world digital computer, we would need a Fourier transform that would work with finite length discrete signal and it would provide a finite length discrete spectrum. For this very purpose, we will have the discrete Fourier transform or DFT. Now, how do we build that discrete Fourier transform? Well, we will start with the fact that we have a finite length discrete signal. I'm talking about this blue signal, which I will denote as X of N. And in general, I will assume that it has capital N samples. Note that if the first index of this blue signal is zero and the signal has capital N samples, then the last index of this blue signal is N minus one. Between zero and N minus one, I have N samples. Now the idea how to analyze this finite length discrete signal is to recycle the type of Fourier transform that we already know has a discrete spectrum. That type of Fourier transform is the Fourier series. The Fourier series already has a discrete spectrum. But the Fourier series is built for continuous time periodic signals, so we will need to make some adjustments. First, we need a periodic signal, so we will need to turn this finite length signal into a periodic one. Well, that is quite easy. We will just take this finite length signal as one period and that we will repeat. This gray signal, which is created by the repetition of this blue signal, we will denote as X sub P and we will call it the periodic extension of this blue signal X. Mathematically, you can define the periodic extension of a finite length signal X of N in this form. This mod denotes the modular operation, but if you do not know what that is, just stick with this picture and you will be fine. Now that we have turned our finite length signal into its periodic extension, we have a periodic signal so we can use the Fourier series, but we still need to adjust it for discrete signals. This can be done in the same way as we did it when we turned the continuous time Fourier transform into the discrete time Fourier transform. We used sampling. So we start with the formula for the coefficients of the Fourier series, which is defined for the continuous time. And now we will sample the time in the integer multiples of the sampling period. When we sample our time like this, we should also express that the period of our signals in seconds will be given as the length of our signals in samples times the sampling period. When I want to compute how long this one period takes in seconds, I need to take the number of samples and multiply that by the sampling period. Now I will take this and substitute that here. When I do the substitution in this continuous time signal, it will turn into this discrete signal and this discrete signal will be that periodic extension X sub P. Now when I substitute this into this exponential, I will get this. Next, I can substitute for this period, which will give me this. Now, I need to note that this is no longer a continuous time signal. This is a discrete signal. I have one value for each integer n. Consequently, I can no longer integrate, but I have to sum. 
And just as here I was going over one period of this periodic signal, this sum will need to go over one period of this periodic signal. So it will need to go from 0 to n minus 1. From 0 to n minus 1. That will sum exactly n samples. Last, in this interval, that is in this interval, the periodic extension and the signal x of n are the same. So instead of the periodic extension, I can just use this signal x of n. So, as a result, I will get this formula, which actually is usable for computing spectra of signals in a digital computer. But before I will use it and call it a discrete Fourier transform, I will make some simplifications. First, this sampling period and this sampling period will cancel each other out. Next, for the sake of simplicity, I will leave out multiplication by this constant. That will probably give me a spectrum that is not properly scaled, but we usually do not care. And when I do these simplifications, I will get this formula, which we call the discrete Fourier transform or the DFT. The discrete Fourier transform can compute a spectrum of a finite length discrete signal. It will give us a spectrum that is discrete. We have one value for each integer k. And on the next slide, I will show you that this spectrum can be described as a sequence of numbers with finite length. So this type of the Fourier transform is finally usable for the analysis of real world signals in a digital computer. In this slide, I will tell you about some basic properties of the discrete Fourier transform. The first property will be the relationship of the discrete Fourier transform with the discrete time Fourier transform. Here I will start from the definition of the discrete time Fourier transform, which is this. Now the discrete time Fourier transform I will apply to a finite length signal. How do I explain to the discrete time Fourier transform that I'm working with a finite length signal? Well, you do it like this. Your signal will be whatever it needs to be in the interval from 0 to the capital N minus 1. In this interval, you will have the capital N samples of your signal. But outside of this interval, I will set the signal to zero. When for some n this signal is zero, this entire summand is zero, and that will not affect the value of the spectrum. Thus, outside of this interval, it's as if this signal was not here. Consequently, I do not even have to sum from minus infinity to infinity. I can change these summation limits and they can go from 0 to the capital N minus 1, that is within this interval. In addition, I will do one more change. I will take this normalized frequency, this normalized frequency, and I will sample it in the integer multiples of 2 pi over capital N. When I use this sampling, when I use this expression for the normalized frequency and substitute it here, I will get this expression. And this expression is nothing else but the definition of the discrete Fourier transform. So this gives me the discrete Fourier transform spectrum of my signal. So the moral of the story is that when I take the spectrum of my signal provided by the discrete time Fourier transform and I sample it in the integer multiples of 2 pi over the capital N, I will get the spectrum of my signal provided by the discrete Fourier transform. I can turn the discrete time Fourier transform spectrum of my signal into the discrete Fourier transform spectrum just by sampling the normalized frequency at these points. So the DFT spectrum is just a sampled version of the DTFT spectrum. Consequently, the properties of the DFT are the same as the properties of the DTFT, except the DFT spectrum is sampled at discrete points. Let me illustrate this on an example. Here I have a very simple finite length signal. The length of this signal, this capital N, is 20, which means that this index N goes from 0 to 19. Now, if outside of the interval from 0 to 19 I would extend my signal with zeros, I would actually get the signal from this slide, that is, I would get this signal. In this slide I also showed you that the DTFT spectrum of this signal is this.
So now I will take this spectrum and I will plot it in this plot with this gray line. So this gray line is the DTFT spectrum of this signal plotted for these normalized frequencies. Now these blue lines in this plot are actually the DFT spectrum of this signal computed by evaluating this sum in MATLAB. And this DFT spectrum of my signal is computed for different values of the index K, that is this index, this index. Now there is a couple of things that you should note in this plot. First, the DFT spectrum, that is these discrete blue lines, are really just the samples of the DTFT spectrum, that is this continuous gray line. And the normalized frequency is being sampled in the integer multiples of 2 pi over the capital N. So, when this k goes from 0 to the capital N, the omega will go from 0 to 2 pi. Check it out here. In this case, the capital N, the length of my signal is 20. And when the index K goes from 0 to the capital N, that is 20, the normalized frequency will go from 0 to 2 pi. And as I told you in the previous slide, the DTFT spectrum, that is this gray line, is periodic with the period of 2 pi. Consequently, the DFT spectrum will have this period, which is the capital N. The DFT spectrum is periodic with the period of capital N. So this is another property of the DFT spectrum. This spectrum is periodic with the period of capital N. In addition, this also means that I have N samples within one period of the DFT spectrum. And this is very convenient, because the DFT spectrum is periodic, I can describe it by knowing a single period. And this period is just a discrete signal with finite lens, which is something we can easily work with in a digital computer. So for example in MATLAB, if you compute the DFT transform of your signal, the MATLAB will give you this first period of the DFT spectrum, that is these first N samples of the DFT spectrum. That is the indices K going from 0 to the capital N minus 1. Also note that when my signal has the length of capital N, a single period of the DFT spectrum also has N samples. So when we work with a single period of the DFT spectrum, it will have the same lens as is the lens of our signal. Now, you need to know what is the relationship between these indices K, the normalized frequency in radians and the frequency in Hertz. I have already mentioned the relationship between these indices K and the normalized frequency omega. That is given by this sampling. And I told you that when the indices K go from 0 to the capital N, the normalized frequency goes from 0 to 2 pi. The relationship between the normalized frequency omega in radians and the frequency in hertz we know from the previous slide. When the normalized frequency goes from 0 to 2 pi, the frequency in hertz goes from 0 to the sampling frequency. And when we know the relationship between k and omega, and omega and f, it is easy to find out the relationship between the indices k and the frequencies in hertz. From this frequency axis and this frequency axis you can read that when the index k goes from 0 to the capital N, the frequency in hertz goes from 0 to the sampling frequency. Here you have the relationship between all the indices and frequencies laid out mathematically. This first formula gives you the relationship between the frequency in Hertz and the normalized frequency. This comes from the definition of the normalized frequency. When you rewrite this formula into this form, you can compute the frequency in Hertz from the normalized frequency. This formula allows you to convert the indices into the normalized frequency. And when you rewrite this formula into this form, you can go in the opposite direction. You can recompute the normalized frequency into the indices K.
Now, when you take this formula and substitute it into this formula, you will get this, which you can use to recompute the indices K into the frequency in Hertz. And when you rewrite this formula into this form, you can go in the opposite direction. You can take a frequency in Hertz and transform it into the value of this index K. A word of caution about this formula and this formula. Both these formulas can give you a fractional value of this index k. But this index k, that is this index k, can only be an integer. So if you use a formula like this in MATLAB, before you use this k, you need to round it. You do not really need to remember all of these formulas. What I would suggest is to remember these three frequency axes and their relationships. And when you are able to draw them, you are able to derive all of these formulas using direct proportionality. So this was the relationship between these indices K, the normalized frequency omega and the frequency in Hertz. Now let's take a look at some additional properties of the discrete Fourier transform. Because the spectrum of the discrete Fourier transform is just a sampled version of the spectrum of the discrete time Fourier transform, for the real signals, the discrete Fourier transform has very similar properties to the properties of the discrete time Fourier transform. The DFT spectrum for some negative index k is the same as the DFT spectrum for the same positive index k, but complex conjugate. When you take the absolute value of this expression, you will get this. The amplitude DFT spectrum at some negative index k will be the same as the DFT amplitude spectrum for the same positive k. And when you take the phase of this expression, you will get that the phase for some negative index k will be the same as the negative phase for the same positive k. When you also include this periodicity, you will get these symmetries. The complex conjugate of the DFT spectrum at some index k will be the same as the value of the DFT spectrum at the n minus that index k. When I take the absolute value of this expression, I will get this. The amplitude spectrum at some index k will be the same as the amplitude spectrum at the n minus that index k. This symmetry is very easily seen in this plot. It is the symmetry with respect to this vertical line. For example, if my index k is 2, I'm talking about this vertical line. And according to this expression, when my k is 2, the amplitude spectrum will be the same at the position n minus 2. So in this case, where my capital N is 20, I'm talking about the index 20 minus 2, which is 18. And that is this spectral line. And you can see that this spectral line is the same as this spectral line. So in the DFT spectrum, we also have this symmetry with respect to this vertical line. Now, when I take the phase of this expression, I will get this. The phase spectrum for some index k will be the same as the negative phase spectrum for n minus that index k. I do not have the phase spectrum plotted here, but if I had, the phase of this spectral line would be the same as the negative phase of this spectral line. And remember, all of these properties hold only for real signals. If the analyzed signals are complex, all of these symmetries can be broken. And last, I would summarize that the discrete Fourier transform is built for discrete finite lens signals. Alternatively, we can consider that one finite lens signal to be a period of a periodic signal, in which case we would say that discrete Fourier transform works on periodic signals. The spectrum of the discrete Fourier transform is discrete and periodic. If we work with a single period of the periodic spectrum, we tend to perhaps slightly incorrectly say that that spectrum has finite lengths. Overall, the discrete Fourier transform allows us to work with signals and spectra that are discrete with finite length. That makes the discrete Fourier transform suitable for the analysis of discrete signals in a digital computer. In this slide, I will give you one additional piece of information about the discrete Fourier transform. Thus far, we have talked about the forward transform that will take the signal in the time domain and turn it into the spectrum in the spectral domain. I still need to give you the formula for the inverse discrete Fourier transform.
Again, without much mathematical derivation, the formula is this. A few notes. This formula is fairly similar to other inverse Fourier transform formulas that we had before. We take the exponentials, the individual frequency components that constitute our signals, we multiply them by their complex amplitudes, which are given by the spectrum of the signal, and then we sum everything together. In this case, the spectrum is discrete, so we have to sum, and the spectrum is periodic, so we will sum over one period of the spectrum. If you crunch the mass, you would see that you also need to divide by the length of the signal to get the proper result in the time domain. And the result in the time domain is not just that finite length signal, it is actually that periodic extension of that finite length signal. But if you limit the values of the indices n to the interval from 0 to the capital N-1, you will get that finite length signal in the time domain.